Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, we're so excited that you are tuning in today. So my name is Jill Weinstock, and I'm the director of Baxter Street. And I'm honored today to provide the introduction to the conversation between Alana Fields and Alan Frame discussing Alana's exhibition, Mirages of Dreams Past. Frame and Fields will discuss the representation of Black queer desire, sensuality, leisure, and memory explored in her large-scale mixed-media collages. This conversation will last approximately 45 minutes with the opportunity for a brief Q&A portion at the end using the chat feature. However, we encourage you to post questions to the message board throughout today's conversation. Alana is a 2020 workspace resident at Baxter Street, and her exhibition is currently on view at 126 Baxter Street through July, June 9th. Our gallery is open from 12 to 6, Tuesday through Saturday, and I hope if you have the opportunity, you will visit us. Alana Fields is a multimedia artist and archivist whose work examines the dialogue between Black queer bodies in the photographic space through gesture and the negotiation between legibility and masking. Field's work has been featured in exhibitions at Untitled Art Fair in Miami, Mokata, Pratt Institute, and the Prince George's African American Museum and Cultural Center. Fields is a 2018 Gordon Parks Foundation Scholar and a 2020 Light Work Artist in Residence. She received her MFA in photography from Pratt Institute in 2019 and has given talks at NYU Tisch School and the Art of Arts and Parsons New School. Alan Framuth is a photographer and a writer based in New York and represented by Gitterman Gallery in New York, which is currently presenting an online show of work from his new book, Fever, previously unpublished color photographs made in New York in 1981, published by Matt Editions. Matt H.Q. also has an exhibition of work from Fever through June. He is a recipient of the 2017-18 Rome Prize from the American Academy in Rome, and the work he made while in Rome was presented in Gitterman Gallery in 2019 and at Pratt Institute in 2018. His 2013 exhibition, Dialogue with Bolano, was presented at the Museum of Art of the Sonora in Hermosillo, Mexico in 2014. In 2021, his work will be included in the exhibition, The Most Beautiful Park, at the Cobra Museum in Amsterdam and an exhibition in Mexichrome at the Palacio de Bellas Artes in Mexico City. Alan Frame has been a supporter of Baxter Street since his dean as board president and currently is a member of Baxter Street Art Advisory Committee. Thank you again for tuning in today. I will now give Alana and Alan the floor. Thank you, Alex and Jill. Um, and thanks everybody for coming. I'm looking at the attendees and it's a stellar list. Um, and I know almost everyone, so it's, it's, it feels great. Um, and Alana and I go back a few years to Pratt. Um, I, Alana, I, I think you're, you know, I've always been a fan of your work, but this, this show at Baxter Street, I think is, is really um, stellar, beautiful. Um, I love so many things about it and that's why I'm interested to ask you questions and hear more about all of your thinking behind it. Um, I was just looking to see if there was anybody I need to admit, but uh, we're co-hosts. So- um, Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm happy to have you here with me speaking about the work. And I'm happy you're excited about it. And I'm looking forward to diving deep. Um, to start with, I'll say in some of your past work, you have used the devices of masking and veiling to create a tension between the revealing and withholding of information, which um, is, can be a metaphor for the scarcity of representations of black queer life in the past and different kinds of suppression and repression. But in this new series, your use of encaustic, it's a very painterly use of encaustic, allows this transparency um, and those bands of encaustic create both a geometric tension with the image 
and I think a kind of amplification of it or intensification of it. So first question is about your use of encaustic and your use of the way that you use it in this series. Yeah, um, as we were, the veils were very prevalent in the way in which I use blacks. And, you know, that was very intentional. I wanted to talk about a lack of visibility or some visibility, but it being negotiated, you know, for, for being illegible, you know, for, for reasons of safety. With mirages, I wanted to, instead of create veils, create a space with the wax, a space that you could enter into. And so that's the logic behind um, a lot of the shapes and the framing. Um, I wanted to create kaleidoscopes with the wax to create frames within, smaller frames within the larger frame of the pieces. And I wanted you to really feel like you could enter into those moments, into those memories. So it's not really about covering or about obscuring, um, rather creating this, this uh, shaped frame for us to for us to enter into um do you want to share your screen and show yeah. some of these images and maybe go through the images on the show for everyone so this piece is close your eyes and remember um, this is a 40 by 50 um, piece, so it's fairly large. So, you know, I, I think about those wide bands of color. They're not, mm -hmm. um, I mean, even within them, there are bands. Um, there's this painterly application of encaustic. Um, but you know, the geometry of them creates this sort of uh, rational structure or, mm. you know, a certain kind of structure while um, I feel like the aspects of repetition and what happens with the kind of beveled effect of um, fragmentation and repetition creates this kind of uh, subjectivity in the image. Yeah. Um, almost like a, it's, it's odd because it's both kind of dreamy and subjective and mm -hmm. more, it brings more structure to it. Um, I mean, I guess one thing that we could say about this snapshot aesthetic is that it's a very casual, offhand, off the cuff kind of aesthetic. And I feel like the architecture of, of the encaustic bands um, gives it this structure, which, but you know, the palette of it also creates a certain kind of emotionality. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's the really beautiful thing about color. Um, you know, like you said, it brings this emotionality to it. I'm really interested in using color um, in a way to engage the senses and by engaging the senses, triggering memory. Um, I think that happens with a lot, you know, our sight, our smell, what we can feel, it draws us back to, you know, little pieces of information that, that, that form memories. I mean, the, the kind of um, mirroring that's going on, the reframing, it's, it's like mirroring this with these repetitions and beveled effects. Um, could you talk about that a little bit more specifically? Yeah, um, I was thinking a lot about, you know, what does it mean to recollect something or to recall your memory? You know, what does it look like? What does it look like to slip into the dream? And a part of that dream being, you know, uh, legible and you can kind of figure it out and, and, and place things and 
then the other part of it is things being out of place and confusing and hard to sort out. And so I wanted to speak to that haze, that clarity, but also lack of clarity when it comes to trying to trigger or engage um, memory or to, to, to create um, memories in your dreams or, you know, uh, occurrences in your dreams that maybe haven't happened in real time. It's interesting because the, the gaze of desire in some of these pictures like this one, um, or the guy lying nude on the bed. Um, I mean, several of them have a kind of gaze of desire, which might in a different context be more problematic, but here that very desire in the image is validating of this culture, you know, of this queer culture that's taboo in the time of these pictures. Um, um, what did I want to say about that? I guess just thinking about how some, some of them celebrate desire itself. Mm -hmm. like this mm -hmm. one is definitely an example of that. Um, I think they're and, quiet and, oh, go ahead. Oh, and you know, and also with that um, intense red in this image and, you know, some other colors in the other one, like the palettes sometimes are intense so that that celebration is like intensely felt. Yeah, I wanted, you know, this is the first time that I used color in this way. And I wanted, I wanted a vibration to be happening, you know, within the images and around it, and also to create that tension between the, the photograph itself and the wax. Um, and I think it vibrates in different ways through color, through the repetition, through um, the uh, decreasing value of the frame, how it's being sucked into the middle. Um, But on desire, I think they are subtle and, and um, loud ways that you can express desire. But I was really interested in these quiet um, expression, expressions of desire that weren't coupled with a partner. You know, what does it look like for us to um, engage with sens sensuality, you know, with ourselves or our home spaces um, or around our home? or in nature, um, there's something so desirable about this to me. It's something desirable about the space. It's kind of out of place and also out of time. Um, but this woman, her freedom, her freedom is desirable, right? And so it's not so much about the sexuality of it, but the way of being in the world um, at a time where we might think that that wasn't really possible in this way. Right. Um, I mean, mostly in previous series, you've mostly worked with photos of gay men. And I know that the vintage photos that you find are not necessarily easy to um, come upon. Um, and I know that you've gotten some from eBay and that images of queer women are even more difficult to find. Um, can you talk about how what that process of choosing and selecting and um, you know looking for the material is like? It's a beautiful process. Um, you know, growing up, I didn't have a lot of representation of you know black queer people you know, outside of uh, very politically charged images. You know, like Stonewall or. Um, uh, AIDS movement and things of that sort. You know, I didn't have images of, you know, what do queer people look like just on the day-to-day -day living life, experiencing joy, sharing pleasure, sharing space with lovers, but also with friends. What did their homes look like? Um, 
and so and looking for these images on eBay, it's it's a way of kind of heal, healing and filling in that filling in that blank that I didn't really have coming up. Um, and finding images, references of, of people who were like me that I could see myself in. And so it's beautiful in that regard, but it is frustrating when um, the same marginalization that I experience in my life, I also see that in the um, missing pockets of, of uh, images of Black queer women in the archival photos that I do find. Um, it's very few and far between. Um, it's very easy for me to find images of, of white queer women, but it's very difficult for me to find images of black queer women. And, um, and, I, and I find much more black queer men. And I think that that speaks to uh, how it has been extremely taboo for black women to be in relationship, romantic relationship with one another and how much harder it has been in a lot of instances to move about the world and to do even do something as radical as taking a picture of yourself and your partner um and that the the, the kind of violence that that may put you in or displacement you know if it was found so it's frustrating um but it validates my experience um but it's very important for me when i do find them to handle them with such care and such intentionality. And this is why this is the centerpiece of, of the show. Um, I feel Black queer women are the centerpiece of everything. Um, and we need to be given more space. And so it was really important for me for this piece to, to, for, for it to take up space in the, in the physical room. Um, are there any queer role models in your past that inspired your interest in using these found images? You know, um, perhaps family members from a different generation or cousins or anybody as like that that you have in mind when you're, because most of the images you're finding are from the 60s and up to the mid 70s, right? Uh, that's what I used for, so for Mirages, it was the 60s and the 70s. But I have images um, as early as the late 1800s and it's um, late as, you know, 1980. So I really have this span of, of time that I'm working with. And um, I think you were, you were telling me about... Um, A family member? No, like some people that you worked with when, when you lived in DC that you kind of looked up to. Oh yeah, um, I was working, I was finishing undergrad and I was like working at Barney's doing my luxury retail thing. And you know, that was fun for what it was, but I found myself in community with a lot of older black queer men. And I, you know, I had just, you know, come out really and, you know, figuring out, you know, what that looks like and, and, and how to sit in that comfortably. And it was so refreshing and so needed to experience people who were so sure of themselves and so unapologetically themselves. So I think that, um, yeah, you I were, think that- You were saying that there was something in their style that was kind of grand and opulent. Yeah, but, there but, was this, um, this shortness, the shortness, right, about however I show up, is, is, as long as I'm comfortable in it, that's what matters. And so I will experience them um, very fluidly presenting masculine and feminine, and I thought that that was so beautiful. Um, I think that a lot of times when we think about androgyny, we think about androgynous women, and so it was really refreshing to engage with men who also maybe didn't identify as androgynous, but had that space within them to be able to, uh, you know, explore, you know, not only their sexuality, but their, their identity, their gender presentation and things of that sort. So I think subconsciously those were planting seeds for, for, for the work that I'm doing now. Can you scroll to the other picture of the, the other female that's in this series? this yes and i'm just curious if you could talk about how you see this person how you see their style 
um, how you see yeah. the attitude? Um, I think this person, you know, has the coolness of like a Tracy Chapman. Um, such ease, such style. Uh, there's a masculinity to her that I'm really drawn to. Um, but there's such softness and warmth around it. And I think that is the essence of Black queer women. And so for me, I, I really love this image. I loved working with it. I loved creating this repetition to really take them to parts um, rather than just Man. dealing with the full frame. Right. The repetition, you know, kind of extends her presence but also it's as if you know as as those bands go to the left and the images repeated to the left as if, as if she's disappearing at the same time mm -hmm. it's like more of her and less and she's like vanishing at the same time it's interesting i mean i think yeah. it's a beautiful disappearing or reappearing yeah depending yeah. on how you look at it Right. I, I love how you're bringing that sense of time and the past into it through that kind of um, pictorial structure. And also just the, the way that you're applying the encaustic and the effect that it has. It's sort of like, and this one, it feels um, more wispy and cloud-like. Yeah, I wanted to bring some of the environment into it. Um, you know, she's not inside the home, but around it. And uh, I wanted to kind of bring a, a wind or a wisp or a, a lightness to it that still had movement, but felt really airy um, and light. I didn't do color here. I just really wanted to deal with, with, with the energy that she was bringing to it. Um. With uh, appropriation in photography, I think that um, for a long time, we saw the appropriation of images from media or advertising and images that weren't personal and could mm. be used more abstractly and conceptually. And I feel like now there's such a strong direction towards working from personal or family archives. You're your work feels like you're working from, you know, an intimate connection with a family archive, but these people are unknown to you. They're, they're strangers. So could you talk about how you feel about constructing this sense of familiarity and family from, from, you know, found photos of strangers? Yeah. I mean, you know, when we talk about the word family, there's so many different definitions to that. Um, you know, some may say like, oh, is she family? And that means like, is that, you know, is that woman queer? And so I'm, I'm thinking about family in a lot of different ways. And I'm thinking about ancestry in a lot of different ways. What does it mean to not have a blood connection, but a communal connection? We're of the same community, um, a spirit connection and things of that sort. And so, there is this ghostly element to the work because I'm largely dealing with people with whom I don't know personally. Um, maybe I know their name. Maybe I know a place where the photograph was taken. Maybe I don't know their name, but I know who they're sending it to. Um, and so in a way, my engagement with them feels like I'm piecing together this history. And whenever you piece together history, you don't always have all of the details, right? But that doesn't keep you away from trying to piece it all together. Um, and so rather than making it about these individuals that themselves, the, the, particularly, the particularities of their life, um, what do they represent? What do their existence represent? And, and how can we engage with that now in a meaningful way? Can you um, go to a different image? Just yeah. any image, just to check it up a little bit. Um, Let's see, y you know, um, in all the series you've used titles in an interesting way. I mean, 
more the way painters do than photographers. Um, and this series especially, there's some very poetic titles such as Kiss My Petals and Weave Me Through a Dream. Can you um, go to that one? The it's actually this one. It's this one, okay. Yeah, Kiss My yeah. Petals and Weave Me Through. Where do you get I thought heart? you had it memorized. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was like, yes, yes, I love that. Um, so for, you know, I usually create my titles um, at the end after the work is completed and, and I build off of, you know, whatever thing, themes I'm working with in the work. But for this work, I wanted to bring some artifact to the work by way of not just the archival photograph, but um, like a cultural art artifact. And so each of the pieces are titled after lyrics found in many Lipitin's album, Come to My Garden, um, which uh, this piece- Tell me about that album. Because Here is titled off of. Uh, so Come to, my, uh, Come to My Garden was her first studio album. It didn't do really well. Um, it wasn't well received um, and it didn't get a lot of play. And so, you know, with that regard, I'm also working with uh, a cultural artifact that wasn't really regarded um, wasn't seen as as important or valuable um, or groundbreaking. And I wanted to work with the album also because, you know, it was made in 1970. These photographs are from the mid to late 60s to the early 70s. And so I wanted something of the same time period, something that um, echoed where they were culturally, but um, also to bring in the lightness and the airiness, the dreaminess that Minnie Ripperton pours into her music um, and specifically that album. Um, it, so much of it feels like a utopia. It feels like an entire space that she created with that album. And, and that's what I wanted to create with these works. And, and so it made sense to bring, bring some of those lyrics, those words from her album into the pieces. You know, when I see a treatment like this of a photograph and many others, but maybe this one is a really good example, um, I could, you know, reach back into art history and think of things like Manet's Dejeuner Celebre, or I could think about color field painting and geometric abstraction and painting. Um, and, you know, the figure, the history of painting the figure and, you know, some tension with that kind of direction and abstraction. But um, what's interesting to me that uh, your background as an undergraduate was in English lit mm -hmm. rather than like studio art. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I'm curious to hear something about that of like what what you were studying before you started making photography and how did you start using photography originally? Yeah, I was studying um, English literature with a focus in African diaspora um, writing and, and, and thought. And so I was reading a lot of um, work about black people by black people. Um, but there was still like an absence there. Um, I wasn't hearing a lot about queer people. And if I was hearing about queer people, you know, they were also, also married to, you know, uh, the opposite sex and carrying on other relationships, um, you know, thinking about the Harlem Renaissance and, and things like that. And so I was always considering literature, cultural artifacts, things of that sort um, with history and my experiences and experiences of people that I know. And so that interest was always there. Um, I did not know that I was going to, you know, peel off into photography, but I took a photography class my last year, uh, my last semester in undergrad, and it really blew my world up. Um, I was super intrigued by the way that I could create narratives, subvert them with photographs. Um, I could create my own archives. I, you know, at a very young, young age, was drawn to 
um, my great grandmother's photo books and my that my great grandfather would, you know, take of the family. And I was looking at these things, people that I'd never met because they were too old. And even at that moment, I was kind of in the pocket of really drawn to the 60s and the 70s, you know, photos that were in the album. And so I think that it's a, a full circle moment. Um, and my study, studying literature and, and our experiences and our history, and then engaging photography and trying to engage history through photography or reframe it. I think it's all very interrelated, um, even if it didn't seem so when it was happening. And then it was in graduate school that you began to play with materials other than photographic materials. Yeah, I would say my second year, my last year, I took a material methods and materials class with Lona Brody, who's amazing. Um, and, you know, we tried a lot of different things and we did encaustics one day and I didn't really know much about working with encaustics or working with wax. Um, I knew of artists like Rashid Johnson who uh, work with wax and, and that sort and different materials, but I hadn't tried my hands at it. And once I did, I really found um, conceptual usefulness in the fact that I could use the wax and it could serve as a literal seal for the photographs, sealing that memory. But it also would deal with the lack of visibility and the shifting of visibility through um, opacity and transparency so that was really the the entry point to working with materials and just uh, I built off that and I'm still building I'm gonna um stop your sharing so that I can share um your website great and look at some other work um can you see this? Mm -hmm. Okay. So the previous um, series, Audacity, mm -hmm. um, that title still ain't studying you. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about that as I go through these these titles and studying you? Yeah. Again, there. Um, I was thinking a lot about nonchalance and and matter of factness, but also having that audacity to, to show up as you are and to not care who, you know, who has an issue with it or to not even be concerned with, with someone else's gaze. And so Ain't Studying You was, you know, uh, from African-American, you know, vernacular, you know, I'm not worried about you. I'm not tripping off that. I'm not studying you. I'm not studying you. Ain't studying you. Mm -hmm. Come Live With Me Angel, again, um, a nod to music, thinking about desire and drawing a lover in, and thinking about Marvin Gaye and um, his masterfulness of, of love songs and, and being really evocative with desire. So that's where that title came in there. Crush Velvet, thinking about um, queer home spaces and how we adorn ourselves and opulence and fabrics and crushed velvet curtains and how that's so specific to a time with paisley prints on them. Um, Butch Queen and Blush, you know, self-explanatory, um, a ballroom photo. And this is one of the simpler pieces one could say, but I really wanted to, again, bring in cultural artifacts. You have this um, encaustic strip that's across that really lends back to the time period, the 80s, those gold nugget watches, jewelry, opulence, um, excess, starlight, um, really shining. You know, in, in the use of photography today, what, what direction is something that's interesting to you? Um, I really love what's happening right now with um, artists who are uh, 
using photography in a way that expands what a, what a photograph means in our relationship to it. Um, artists who are working with material and, and creating that tension there. Um, how does material uh, surface um, the illusion of flatness, um, but the, the refusal, ref, refus, refusal of being flat? I'm really interested in those ideas and, and artists who are, uh, who are looking at that. Um, the way you created these planes of color, um, you know, in this force of abstraction and some of these pictures with book covers was really interesting to me. Yeah, um, these, go ahead. And it makes sense then to think of, of you as an English lit major <laughs> and being sort of bookish or something. Yeah, yeah. Um, I was also thinking about, you know, these covers reminded me a lot of, of, of photo albums that I would look at um, when I was younger, but also there's something about it that kind of mimicked um, a very old Bible cover. Um, and those are two places that photos of queer people um, in my experience would be absent from the photo album and from the Bible. And um, I wanted to kind of bring that information in there also here, um, it's a red book cover. Interrupting the body. And even in these works, you can see that, you know, there aren't a lot of direct gazes. Um, that connection isn't there. Um, it's denied in a lot of, in, in a lot of senses and with mirages, that's not present. You know, you're fully able to engage with the gaze of, of the subject and they're gazing directly at you. Um, are, are you, do you still have a book in the works with Meteoro editions? Yeah, we should um, be dropping that in the fall. Okay, the this is a, uh, a publisher in Amsterdam, um, Pablo Lerma, who is also uh, an artist who draws from archives and his whole publishing enterprise is geared towards artists who are working from archives. Um, so that's exciting that you're gonna do a book with him. Um, yeah, yeah. And then um, when Saturday you have uh, Um, wait, sorry. Um, you the have show a show opening at Yancey Richardson. Can you tell I us do. about that? Yeah, it's um, called Mining the Archive. It's a group show. Um, I think about seven artists um, curated by Kyle Shevermont. Um, really excited um, for that opening. Um, the pieces in that show are also a part of the series Mirages, but the, they are new works. So this is an ongoing series. Um, so it's Michelin Thomas and um, Leslie Hewitt and who else is in that show? Uh, Lau Ashton Harris, Deborah Roberts. Um, Wardell Milan. Yes, someone else, I'm forgetting someone. Um, great company. Todd Gray, um, yes. I don't know how I forgot that. <laughs> <laughs> we have some good questions in the chat. Um, and let me read one of them from Jan Ratia. It's, um, or we could, um, well, I'll, I'll, I think we could unmute let them Jan ask. Yeah. to let him ask it. Why don't we try to do that? Okay. Um, let's see. Um, you should be able to unmute now if you have a question that you'd like to ask. Great, great. Jan, you want to ask that? Sure. Sorry about that. Just trying to figure it out. Hi. Um, so I was curious about the, what I'm calling sort of the multiplicity that is being created with then each one of the works that you are currently showing. 
And to me, it feels like you are either creating a, or even expanding a subjecthood beyond the, the singularity of the person. So I was wondering that, um, I would love to hear you talk a little bit more about that because it's to me, obviously something that is, goes beyond just the formal strategies of art making. And I wanted to see what, what, what your thoughts were. I love that yeah. phrase, expansion of subjecthood. That's very apropos. Go ahead, Ilan. Yeah, I think in each of the images, there are a lot of things happening. And when I say the images, I'm referring to the, the original photographs themselves. So what you're seeing um, are crops and, and new photographs out of an old photograph. Um, but there are a lot of things happening in the originals. You're dealing with the history of whoever that person is and not really being able to access it because you don't know who they are. Um, you're dealing with the existence of them as a queer per person in space. You're dealing with whatever context, you know, the photograph is in, whether they're in the home, whether they're partnered, whether it's whether they're not. So there's a lot of, of layers that exist already in the work. And so when I come in with the wax, that's adding even more layers or, or rather um, regarding the layers, um, highlighting them, exposing them more, framing them so that we can see them. Um, I think all of that is, is really important when you think about subjecthood, when you think about um, how to fully honor uh, what it, the self, but also how the self is connected to uh, the community and, and how to view that in the concept of, of history, um, the history of photography, the history of Black people, of queer people, uh, the history of art and what's been represented and what's not. So um, I'm working with all of those things at, at once and, and trying to bring um, specified attention to them and, and the way that I frame them. And, and, Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Thanks, Alana. Um, there's also a question from Arda Asina. Arda, do you want to unmute and ask that? Yeah, sure. Hi, Ellen. Um, hi, hi, Arda. <laughs> hi, Alana. Um, hi. Wonderful work. Thank you um, for doing this. Uh, so I, I was interested in this um, idea of saving these images of queer people of color because it feels like an intentional gesture. And um, as I wrote, it feels like you're creating a space of potentiality, which I find pretty refreshing at this time. So I was curious to know whether um, you were interested in identifying these people that you saved the images of, or was that even ever an option for you? Um, so it's not an, it's not something that I am interested in doing across the board because there's just some information that I can't draw out from it. You know, there are just certain things that I don't know. But when I do have some information, there are times that I that I leave it in the work, that I engage it in the work. Um, for one of the pieces that's um, in the group show Min Mining the Archive at Yancey Richardson Gallery, there's a piece called um, uh, Reynard's Refrain. And the person in the photograph, his name is Reynard. And, and so we have that information of who the person is. We're honoring their name and, and um, what that means. But also, you know, what does it mean to, to really honor somebody and, and, and exalt them? And that's something that I wanted, that I, that I find important to do when I have the information. But if I don't have it, then, you know, there are other things that we can engage with if, if, we don't know the exacts of this person's life. Um, what symbolism can we draw from it to, to speak about the lives of others? I'm Thank just you. gonna um, share my screen again to take a look at a couple of those images in the upcoming show. Um, this is McLean Thomas, these two, but this, this is yours. Mm -hmm. And this one's, here we go, Canyons Beyond Time. Yeah. And this is the one you were just talking yeah. about. Mm -hmm. Can you just repeat what you were saying about that specifically? Uh, so um, on the back of this photograph, 
was written the person's name, his name was Reynard. And um, I wanted to, you know, in a sweet way, kind of honor him, his existence um, as a person, as a queer person, but specifically, you know, who he was and what I had was a name. And so I brought that into the title um, so that when we refer to this person, we can call them by name because we know it, we have that information. Um, and I think it's the best way of, of honoring someone. You know, our names carry such importance. Um, and who knows? Maybe he didn't, uh, maybe that wasn't his birth name. Maybe he, you know, renamed himself. Uh, you know, that's, a, that's the best way that you can, you know, claim some agency for yourself, naming yourself. So uh, I named this piece after him. And uh, what about this one? Canyons Beyond Time. Um, and so this is, I guess, a different mode of mirages, um, returning back to uh, the close-ups, the zooms, the crops, but also working really intentionally with um, repetition and uh, doubling, tripling, and quadrupling here. Um, I wanted to engage the wax in a way that it really had mentioned. And I started thinking about canyons. And again, these are lyrics from Minnie Ripperton's album. Um, I, I freestyled that one a little bit or, or remixed it rather. Um, it's not a direct lyric, but I was thinking about uh, what, de what describes depth for me. Um, and when I was looking at this, I thought about canyons. I thought about highs and lows and depths and, and places that we can get to and that we can't. And I think that memory is like that too. Um, I was also thinking about the gold tones uh, in his face and the gold and canyons and um, creating levels, uh, uneasiness, unstraight lines, symmetry, asymmetry. Um, great. Um... I have a quick question. Can I just jump in? I didn't Please talk. do. Hi, Lali. Hi, Ellen. Hi, Alana. Fantastic. Hi. Um, it was Alana, very... Lali also did her MFA at Pratt before you, and she teaches at Ithaca College in, in New York. Beautiful. Yeah, yeah nice, nice to meet you. So, um, you know, you're, you're selecting these images from the archive, and one of the things that I'm interest, interested in is how do you decide which images to pick and which ones to apply in caustic on. Like I, I know you mentioned in the talk that you crop certain images and you select sections that you're using, but um, when gathering these from the archives, how many images do you have access to and how do you know if these fit in with what you're trying to say? Um, I guess I want to know a little bit more about the process of selecting the specific mm -hmm. people and, you know, and Alan was talking about how uh, in some of these images, uh, there's this element of desire. And I'm wondering if you're thinking about these things when you're choosing the images or, or is it more of an instinctive process? Do you know beforehand what the image is gonna look like or do you just instinctively go through it and pick some images? I don't know, it's a long worded question. I don't know if it makes yeah. sense. Yeah, I'm a crazy person. I, um, I go onto eBay and I, you know, multiple times a day, um, if it's a busy weekend, <laughs> maybe I don't get to it, but yeah, I'm a stalker. I, I can admit that. Um, but I'm just interested in the breadth of images that are available. And so most of the time, um, my search is pretty broad in terms of the things that I select. Um, the thing that makes me press by um, or to, you know, get really crazy in a bidding war is something that really vibrates that, that makes me feel, um, that makes me emote or uh, something that I just feel like there's a, represent, a lot of representation of. So I've collected this, um, I have maybe about seven or eight images of queer people and trees. Um, and so I didn't set out looking for queer people and trees, but in the <laughs> two, three years of finding photographs, I'm able to now categorize them into these really sweet and lush categories. Um, and so 
yeah, it's it's kind of a, a broad looking. And when I'm working on a specific project like this one, the first image that I started with was uh, the image in Come to My Garden, um, the woman who's laying in, in the grass. And it had such a vibe to it. It had this lightness, this airiness, this sense of freedom, joy, it felt magical. And so for the show, I went on a hunt to find other images that had that same feeling to it, right? So mm. yeah, I hope that helps. Yes, yes. That was great, yeah. yeah I that should was have asked that question. Yeah, I Good love the, uh, I want to see the images of queer people in trees now. <laughs> uh, see all <laughs> the categories that you have, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's great to know the process, thanks a lot. Thanks, Thank Laura. you. Um, anybody yeah, else? Okay. Yes. Um, hi, Alana. Hi. Thank you. Um, hi, Alan. Um, hi. I was curious if you would ever use images from your family, because you mentioned that that's kind of the impetus of, you know, kind of thinking about the archive. And, yeah. you know, the second part of the question is, or would you ever consider taking your own images of you know, people in trees, you know, to augment mm -hmm. like, the ones that you have found to kind of create a conversation between um, something that you have mined and others that you've created. Yeah. Um, okay, two parts. I'll take care of the family photos first. Um, so to my knowledge, I am the first out queer person in my family. That's fine. It's not. Um, but it also means that, you know, you're first in a lot of the ways or assumed the first. Um, I do have a family member who I know is queer, but, you know, everyone still refers to their partner as, you know, their friend. And so I think that there's a lack of comfortability in my family, especially with the older generation of even like just naming things or calling them what they are. And so that's why I haven't really used any images of queer people in my family because when I, I can't really find any. Um, but that makes me think a lot about the artist Daryl Ellis and um, you know, what does it mean to like work through complex relationships or dynamics um, through working with family archives. And so I think there's a lot of room there to work with some of those images. It just may not be in the way that I've worked with images of, of, of uh, queer people. Um, as far as taking my own photographs, I think there's a lot of interest for me. Um, and you know, what does it look like to recreate some of these photos set in the time that they are? And so that's something that I've been thinking about a lot lately. Um, but, you know, there's always 10 projects up here and <laughs> one at a time, maybe two. Um, since you mentioned Daryl Ellis, I just want to jump in and say that I was so um, excited that in the making of a monograph of Daryl Ellis's work, Visual Aids has been uh, doing, it's going to launch in the fall. They decided to invite a group of young artists to comment on his work um, with the curator and writer Ariel Goldberg. And those comments are being compiled in the book. And um, Alana was one of those artists and Paul Sapuya was one. I can't remember all the rest, but um, that, you know, Daryl was, Daryl Ellis was 33 when he died. And so, you know, now there's a show that just happened at Candace Mady, but his work was unseen for many years. And I feel like when it reemerged, you know, it's almost as if um, he were a younger emerging artist since a lot of people didn't know the work or know about him. And that there would be this connection with your generation commenting on the work mm -hmm. and talking about it's his legacy, I thought it was really special. Yeah. Um, yeah. For sure, love his work. And I and I feel like particularly formally, there's a big connection between the two of you in this last series. Just the the idea of framing and reframing 
since mm -hmm. he was so intent on creating uh, ways to kind of um, uh, create a, an imposed structure of fragmentation and reframing onto family imagery. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but it, it's, it's interesting once, um, I, I think you know this, Alana, but I'm not sure you do. You know, um, a couple of years ago, I gave Alana this collection of photographs around this one black man in the army and his friends. And there were a lot of pictures of him and so on. But, mm -hmm. you know, looking at them, I think I, a queer person would look at them and get the sense that this man, the protagonist of the group of pictures was himself mm -hmm. queer. Um, yeah. there's, there's nothing to actually, you know, uh, specify that, but I found yeah. that- It's interesting that you say that <laughs> because there, there are a couple of images with him and what might be a girlfriend or a wife. So it's that weird tension where you look at the majority of them and it gives you this one read and somehow this one kind of complicates the understanding of the others. But, uh, you know, I found them on the street in the early 90s, like just like on the curb. Somebody had thrown them out and they were all together. I think that's where I found them. Maybe I found them in a flea market, but I think that's where I found them. And I offered them to Daryl Ellis. Did I tell you that? No. I offered them to Daryl Ellis and he was quite offended that I would think he might want to use pictures that were not of his of family. his family, yes. <laughs> <laughs> that I had just like not grasped his work or his intentions enough to understand that. And it's funny, like then I had them all these years and I didn't know what to do with them. And then I gave them to you. Yeah. And, um, and then you're like, you know, not, wanting to use your family pictures and you would rather use mm -hmm. these anonymous found pictures and so on. It's very interesting. Yeah, you can't make it up. <laughs> I didn't, but you didn't, yeah, you didn't tell me that. I didn't know that piece about um, you offering them to Daryl and, and uh, you know, being told that you did so. Um, but yeah. Surprise. Thank you. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, I think, um, we should probably conclude now. Alana, thank you so much for doing this with me. It was really um, wonderful to hear all your thoughts about all of your work. And Jill and Alex, thanks for um, hosting and supporting us. And would you like to, anybody else have a final say? Yeah. Thank you, Ellen. Um, yeah, go for it all. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, thank you, Alan. Um, it's always a pleasure to, you know, talk through the work with you. You've been such a great support um, and mentor. So I, I appreciate you so much. Thank you, Jill. Thank you, Alex, for, for all of your work and your grinding um, with the exhibition. I really do appreciate it. I love that Zoom exists and, and we can do these things across space. Yeah. Um, um, I'm in Italy in the tower of a castle at a residency. So it seems appropriate <laughs> that I'm talking to you about the, at the end of your residency and the show for your residency. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, thank you, Alana and Alan and everyone for joining us and giving us a really engaging conversation and allowing us to get deeper into the work. Um, really appreciate it. And um, Alex, you wanna close us out? Yeah, um, thank you everyone for coming. Thanks again to Alan and Alana for your time and for this great conversation. Um, I just want to remind everyone that Alana's show, Mirages of Dreams Past, is currently on view at Baxter Street, um, 126 Baxter Street in New York, and it will be up through June 9th. Um, so we really hope that you get a chance to come see it before it closes. Um, our hours are Tuesday through Saturday, 12 to 6. Um, and this conversation has been recorded and will be available on Baxter Street's website and YouTube channels afterwards if you wanna, if you wanna revisit it. Um, thank you again to everyone for coming. Thanks, Alan and Alana. Um, I hope you all have a great rest of your evening.
Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. Bye, everybody. Bye. Thanks, yeah. everyone. Bye, bye. Have bye. fun in Italy, Alan. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Lolly. I'm bye. having fun. <laughs> bye, Lolly. Bye. Hi, Donna. Bye. bye nice Donna. to see you. Bye. Hey, Alan. Thank you. Take bye -bye. care.